Good night, yeah. Thank you. All right, it's live. It's podcast time. You are listening to the RGM Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Monday, a new podcast here at RGM HQ. I'm Carl Maloney, the host of the show, and I'm bringing you a, another brand new show from the home, uh, celebrating what goes on behind the scenes at grassroots level in the music industry. And we've got a very special guest for you today, ladies and gentlemen, too. Um, so let's shall we, shall we get cracking? Right, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a bit of a childhood hero on my hands here today. I've got Rick Witter from Shed 7. How are you doing, mate? You all right? Hello, Carl. You all right? Yeah, sound, mate, really. I wanted to start off this interview chat thing. We're going to get to the big tour that's, you know, that's been announced recently. And we're yeah, all we'll get excited about it. Get to the jazz ons in a bit, yeah? We'll get to, yeah. I keep doing that today. I'm just a bit <laughs> overexcited myself. Um, but I can't... I, you, might, you, you won't remember me, but we've met before, Rick. Um, we... My band actually supported you at the Leadmill in Sheffield when you did Rick oh. Witter and the Dukes years Oh, years right, ago. okay, yeah, right. Well, and, I usually say I can't remember the 90s, but I can't remember the noughties either. <laughs> fair <laughs> enough, fair <laughs> enough. Um, but I, just from being around you and around this, you, you're known in the industry as one of the nicest guys out there. And Right. The, the, well, for, <laughs> are you going to challenge that? <laughs> It's news to me, but it's. Is it really? I like. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Well, I'd heard that before I met you years ago at the Leadmill when we supported you that time, and uh, I actually asked you for an autograph from my sister. That's a big, massive Shed Seven fan, and you went out of your way not just to write a little autograph thing. You went out of the way and actually made. It. You wrote up and drew up a birthday card for her, oh. uh, and wished her happy birthday. And she's still got that card. I'm going to post it online as part of the promotion for this podcast. <laughs> It's you, 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 you make fans for life engaging with people that way, don't you? Well, yeah, listen, that's kind of the point. At, certainly in this day and age of social media, mm. you know, people ask you questions on social media, and I think it's just the right thing to do to reply. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, there, there was a time where you'd have to write to bands and, and wait months perhaps for a response. Yeah. But, you know, if somebody's going to ask me a, a good question, on Twitter, I'll just I'll just answer it. Yeah. So and and also, if anyone wants me to make them any birthday cards, that's fine. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just become the new Clintons. <laughs> well, it, we've got to so go. What's your sister's name? Rachel Maloney. Rachel, well, hello, Rachel, and I'm glad <laughs> you've kept the card. She she's still got it, and she'll be chuffed by that. So thanks again, man. Just it, it's it's something that stuck with me throughout my whole music career after finishing with a band and starting this magazine and just doing the things that I do now. Try and give back to the industry a bit and help bands on their way up. And that's kind of what this podcast is all about, really. And throughout the the topics on this podcast, we we like to talk about things that are out there in the industry. Uh, and I wanted to start and bring up a couple of uh, topics, if that's all right with you, and see what your thoughts are on a few things. Yeah. Okay. So the, okay. the first, the first, one of the biggest things that I'm seeing around a lot at the minute is that there's not enough women on festival lineups. There's, there's a lot of uproar online when festivals announce the lineups at the minute. There seems to be a real lack of solutions coming from the people that are outraged from it as well. That feels a little bit problematic. There's a lot of people shouting that, you know, festivals are this way when there's no real solutions coming out about how we can work together and make, and make that change really do you have any thoughts on where the industry is around the, this topic uh well i think it's it's a pretty simple and easy solution mm. festival festival promoters just in just ask more female artists to do mm. it surely isn't it you know i think festival female artists would probably jump at the chance of playing at some good festivals so and there is a lot of them out there yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm not really too overly uh, overly knowledgeable about this particular problem. You're kind of almost bringing it to light to me. Okay. Um, but just just invite more female artists to play at your festivals. It's as simple as that, isn't it? How, how, do you have any thoughts on why you think it is heavily weighted for male artists at this moment in time? Uh, no, I've got no idea, and it should. Yeah. This shouldn't even really be an issue, should it? Music's no. music, music's yeah. music, and whoever's creating it, and they're getting they're getting a, a 
a bit of success out of it. Mm. I'm talking about the bigger festivals now that have yeah. the bigger name. It's just an issue that shouldn't be an issue. Just, yeah. just spread the field, you know. It's as simple as that. I mean, I actually do a radio show on a Sunday evening. Um, and without even really giving it any thought, I, I get to pick whatever I want to play for two hours on a Sunday evening. And it's it's not even a, a thought about, oh, I'm not playing enough female or male acts. I just, I just amass a set of songs and it just so happens to be what it is, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, now, the, the media industry has changed. You know, I, I've been in and around bands for years. Um, aren't we all? Um, and the media has changed so much as well. So it's, the years are gone where print media is a thing. Um, it's all changed to online. Then there's more independent blogs like ourselves that are out there. Um, how have you adjusted as a musician through with, with the change in how music is reported and talked about? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's totally different for what, for what it was like in the 90s. Um, and there's pros and cons, isn't there? You know, I think the pros of it are there is a lot more like what you're doing, which is a positive thing, because, you know, there's more avenues to hear music and to and to find out about things. Yeah. Um, but then you don't get the, you know, and obviously now a lot of artists write and even record at home, you know, they don't even need to go to a studio properly to do it. But then the other side of that is the, the promotion of it could get lost uh, because there is that much that much going on. You know, it's difficult to, to promote yourself as, as much in the respect of trying to spread the word. But, you know, everything is just so immediate, which is kind of why we called our last album Instant Pleasures, because it is you just, just, everything's just at the click of a button. And that's why we kind of made a big point of trying to write an album that was like an old school album that every track on it was worthy of being on it. And, and the, the running order was quite important. We wanted it to make it feel like a side A and a side B, like an old vinyl record. Uh, because, because of the fact that in this day and age, you know, music doesn't seem as special anymore in the sense that you don't, buy an album and, and listen to it all you just right I'll just I just like that one song so I'll just buy that one song immediately and and disregard the rest of that bit of art you know so yeah it's yeah it's uh it's there's pros and cons with everything really isn't there there's a, another thing that we've been trying to bring to uh well make it more transparent really and be open and honest about where we are with everything is that because every, there's a lot more people like us around in the world and the market's saturated with people starting blogs and all that kind of stuff. There doesn't seem to be any regulation of it. And there doesn't seem to be any challenge back to people that make unrealistic claims about their readership, about their numbers, about what they actually um, are doing, which is, it, it, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine, really. I, we've started publishing our um readership just so we're open and honest about it if we're if we're going to open up the conversation we need to be transparent and, and do that i think do you, yeah. do you think do you think there's something there that the industry needs to look at uh well it's the music industry has always been a messy industry hasn't it really <laughs> yeah, it's always been, it's always been backhanders and and <laughs> and false claims i mean nothing's going to change so fair play to you for being so transparent yeah <clears throat> you know i mean it, just look at spotify at the minute you know, <clears throat> I think I read a tweet the other day about um, there's Mercury nominated acts who are, who are struggling to pay their rent, and the the owner of Spotify has just bought a football team. You know, I mean, what yeah. you know, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. But it's nothing new, and mm. you know, you we do need people like your good self bringing things these things up. But you know, it's going to take a long time to fix that broken record. I think. We're not going to be able to fix it, are we? We just have to keep doing as best at what we do, I think. It's just one of them. Just, just keep getting the plasters out, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, one another little topic as well, which I've, I've found really fascinating when previous guests have talked about it, is is for, for new band. When, when we talk about a new band, they're for, you know, they've had a few singles out, and they make a decision quite early to bring an album out. I've, I've kind of found it, it can sometimes harm a new band by bringing an album out too quick. So you put that much work and effort into it, and then you've got a relatively small audience online or, you know, just out there in the world anyway. Um, wouldn't it be better just to keep releasing a few singles every now and again than put this big, massive piece of work out that's, 
that's going to fade in maybe just a two or three weeks, maybe. Do you have any thoughts on? Or yeah, any, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, my son is who's 20s in a band now. Yeah. And that's exactly what you've just said. Mm. They are releasing sporadic singles um and just kind of playing on that for for a, a couple of a, a few weeks couple of months you know just hammering that point home because you know as i say in this day and age it's coming from all from all angles and it, you can get lost in a sea of of other acts yeah. um um i think I, i'm that once that there's 60,000 new uh singles released on spotify every day it might be yeah, week or well, day but it's just like how would, how would you yeah. stand out in that crowd? Yeah, exactly. I think I think one thing that used to help, even though it's kind of could potentially could be a hindrance as well, is when people are lumped together into scenes because it kind of, you know, if you like one band and you're told that these other four bands are very similar and it's called mm. Britpop or whatever it might be, you know, it can kind of help the bands but then you, but then at the same time, you get typecast. So it, it's a, it's a very tricky problem. But I guess if you just write really good songs, mm. it's less likely to be a problem because you know, in the long run, people are going to pick up on it. I'm just I, I'm I'm going to move on to this question because I've got it for later. Just because you mentioned songs, when you were writing "Going for Gold," did you know? Did you think this is definitely going to be a fucking hit? This is this is it. Uh, well, <laughs> funnily enough, that was off our second album mm. and we'd had a bit of success with the first album it did what we wanted it to do change giver and then we went off to write some new stuff for the second album and uh, i think going for gold was one of the first kind of things that we attempted to do for maximum mm. high and when we'd written about four or five songs we were called down to london to polydor records because the managing director wanted to hear what we were doing to make sure that it was up to scratch so to speak or yeah. better better than our debut and we had to perform that song to him in a in a very small room with just him as the audience and he wasn't massively <laughs> keen crowd he wasn't massively keen on it to be <laughs> honest so we took it away uh and added brass and mm. just maybe just just spun a few little bits around and then it became going for gold so, so no when we were writing it we weren't really over convinced that it was going to do as well as it did I think I think chasing rainbows was a bit yeah. more obvious to us. Um, that took literally about twenty five minutes to write that song, and but we kind of it was one of those songs where you do look at each other thinking, "Well, I think we're onto something here." Is it when when you're in the writing process and it just happens organically and naturally, and in twenty five minutes, are they generally the better songs that come out? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's almost like you just grabbing them from thin air it's like oh thanks i'll take that you know what i mean there's certain times where you, you're convinced that it's somebody else's work because mm. it's just so easy <laughs> you think well that must yeah. have been done before but, and then when you discover that it hasn't that's that's probably one of the biggest buzzes you can get writing music yeah yeah i can imagine i can imagine uh, last little topic just from the group of uh subjects we've been discussing on the podcast is do you subscribe to any um any conspiracy theories rick i do not <laughs> i think the uh the person that you need to ask yeah uh, is in shed seven would be the drummer alan leach okay so if you want to do your own personal podcast with alan get in touch with him he'll, okay. he'll, he'll keep you entertained with conspiracy theories theories what, what's his favorite one and i'll get in we'll, we'll get in touch uh well flat earth was always a big one really Okay. Yeah, and uh, and the current situation, but I won't say any more than that. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so, yeah, we started this podcast, and we've started. We've changed it recently. We used to edit it quite heavily and not um, just edit out all my ums and ers, but they're all here now. I've decided to make it live and a bit more of a radio show because I think it, I think it gives it more energy really when it's not edited and it's just recorded live like a radio show as a yeah. broadcast as a broadcaster yourself for Jorvik radio how do you what tips do you have for broadcasters to keep things fresh in this ever-changing media world well i have my own set ways of doing stuff and and mm. mine is totally live i don't think i mean i've pre-recorded a few shows in the past if i've gone on holiday or something but 
Mm. I don't like pre-records. I, I think they're stale and boring. Yeah. I like to connect with the people listening. So yeah. I come up with various different things, like I'll think of a word and then people will have to tweet me to tell me what word, songs they know of with that word in the title. Yeah. But that's an immediate connection and I can read out their names and their suggestions. I always say if I like a, a particular suggestion, I might even play the song they've suggested, but I never do because I've always got my <laughs> my own nope. set lined up. Um, you know, and I think I think having structure is really important. So yeah. you, you jingles or whatnot, and you your particular points that you want to achieve are all in the same place every week, and then it just becomes almost like a, a really comforting book. So you mentioned earlier, it's quite interesting that you you play your own songs on on Jorvik. Um, has, has that ever been a battle uh, working for a radio station, having that freedom? I wouldn't do it if I if I didn't have that. I mean, this is this is like local local radio mm. for, for, for from in York, but because on in this day and age you can listen online or you can ask Alexa, then I do have a lot of people listening all over the country. So it's mm. it's a win win for me because I I really enjoy spending time through the week working out what I'm going to play in the next in the next show and I've got two hours so I've got basically about room to play about 15 songs with all of the chat that I do in between so you know I really enjoy working out a set list and making it different it's you know making all the bands different from each other so it's not just one long boring indie show you know <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Plus, uh, plus, every now and again, I'll play Shed Seven, so that's that means I get about twelve p. <laughs> nice one, bonus. <laughs> little boat, little Christmas bonus for you there. All mounted up, didn't it? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so, I, I, the journey of Shed Seven. Then, so I, I can remember watching Shed Seven. That the first song I heard of Shed Seven that got me involved with Dolphin. I'm just like, here we go. I found a new band that I like. You know, when you just get that cassette and it's. You think, yeah, here we go. We've got a new band on my hands here. Here we go. Nice one. And I can remember that's watching... always the right thrill, isn't it? When you find yeah. that, I always, I always get a real good buzz. If I hear a band that I didn't even know existed, I'll think, oh, brilliant. This is going to be good to listen to. And then when you find out perhaps that they've actually already had two or three albums, that's an even bigger buzz because there's a lot of stuff to go back and sift through. Yeah. And what I kind of remember from the early days is. And, and it always little things that you've done throughout the career have stuck with me. And one of them was I can remember you busking in Sheffield City Centre before the gig, letting people know that you're in town and you know there's a gig on later on. Can you remember anything of the early days of you know and, and making the decision to do that? Because not a lot of people do that kind of stuff. Um, no, I think it would have all just been a natural. Why don't we just do this? I don't think it, I don't think we'd ever really over no, plan. plan. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, I mean, and now I'm talking going back to being. 14 or 15 in school mm. bands with Tom and Paul when, yeah. you know, we've, we've been, we were in the same year at school. So we've just grown up together. You know, we, even that goes down to even the writing of songs. We, we don't sit down and discuss writing songs yeah. and how we could potentially do it. We just do it. It's all, it, Shed Seven's always been just a very natural thing. It just, it just kind of happens, you know, yeah. and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't like anything really. But yeah, I think, we have mad ideas, and if we think they're funny enough, we'll do it. Like, for example, uh, before we were signed, we were just a band from York, and we were supposed to play this particular bar, but it, and so we turned up at soundcheck time mm. on the day of the gig to discover that we weren't allowed to play because they hadn't got the music licence sorted. So mm. we were disappointed because we wanted to play. So we put a, a sign on the front of the pub door saying, sorry, we're not playing here, but if you want to come and see us, go to Sainsbury's car park and there was a Sainsbury's down the road. So we got a generator, plugged the amps into there and played in Sainsbury's car park instead. How did that go? Well, I think there was probably about 120 people there. Oh. Um, and this is outside, outdoors. I, I think it was like the top of the car park. Oh. So we kind of thought, oh, we can, we're missing a trick here. So we thought we halfway, we played about eight songs and halfway through, I ran off to the nearest phone box and phoned the police as if I was a, someone living nearby and there was loads of noise, uh, complaining about the noise, yep. hoping that the police had turned up and we might get a bit of press attention yeah. out of it. Uh, so I ran back and we carried on playing, no police. <laughs> 
then we finished the gig, we'd run out of songs to play, so all of the crowd left. And as we were packing our gear away, the police arrived. <laughs> so it didn't, okay, fair enough. didn't really have the desired effect. <laughs> <laughs> but, so how long has Shed 7 been Shed 7 then now? 1990. Wow. So a long time. Years, is that? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's... Uh, I wish you hadn't asked me that now. I feel old. <laughs> what's the what's the secret to a long career in the music industry? Uh, probably trying your hardest to do it your own way and doing mm. it naturally. Not having too many set plans, I'd say, for us personally. I mean, other people yeah. might think different. But yeah, I mean, we, as I say, we've had our ups and downs. We've fallen out. We've, yeah. we've, had, a, we've had a hiatus for a couple of years. We've, we've done everything a classic band should do. Mm. And now it's very satisfying and pleasing and lucky and we're all thankful for the fact that we are still here 31 years later doing it and having a modicum of success with it so you know i think the older you get the more you realize that you shouldn't take anything for granted yeah. so we we've just put a big tour on sale for the end of the year and people are already buying tickets for it and it's just such a lovely thing to see mm. and and i think we're quite i feel quite honored really to, to be doing it and you know, we are, a very, we are a very good live band, but we're also very lucky that we have a good, strong fan base and they know what they're going to get when they come to see us. Yeah. And we like to deliver. So it's like a massive game of tennis every gig where we throw it out there and then we get given back to us and we're just yeah. like a gig love tennis match. I think what, just from the outside looking in at Shed 7, you've built relationships through the years. So it, I've, I've set a couple of examples of how you've like, influenced me and just um given me that idea of shed seven just being great guys and you know they, they love the fans and they, they get involved and they're always they have questions like you said on twitter and that kind of stuff i was speaking to martin atkins who used to be in pill uh, the drummer for pill and nine inch nails recently and he's a teacher now in chicago and he and, and he shares the art of um connecting with your fans at the gigs so he's a big ambassador for a band to stand around the merch stand and speak to the fans on the way in and out on the way out he'll always say if you see somebody that's a bit skin give him a t-shirt you'll make a fan for life um yeah. i'd like to see I, I, I don't see a lot of that around but it, it feels like you guys have always done that and it's really paid off having that kind yeah. of attitude yeah, well, and we've not even really thought about it. We, again, we didn't set out to think, right, well, let's do this. It's yeah. just, we're just guys, you know. I mean, obviously, we're cool guys, but we're guys. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What <laughs> what pitfalls are out there? You mentioned your son's in a band now. What pitfalls do you share with your son and help him try and navigate past within the industry for newer bands these days? Yeah, well, I, I don't ever tell him what to do, but I'll give him advice if he asks yeah. for it. You know, I just think the, the thing with new bands and up and coming bands is just have that work ethic and be not necessarily polite and yes, sir, no, sir. I mean, have the swagger by all means, but just, mm. you know, appreciate what's happening to you and and more good things will happen because of it, off the back of it. But I think it's very important to have a, a good work ethic and just get out there and don't give up if, if you play in front of two people. Pretend yeah. you're playing at Wembley, you know, just don't give up. Don't go home disheartened because you didn't get as much interest as what you thought you might do because you're just, just having the wrong type of day. If yeah. you believe in what you're doing and it's coming straight from your heart, then stick at it because good things will happen. Definitely. I was speaking to a, a young Sheffield band recently, um, Crossfire Eagles, and one of their dads is out of Def Leppard. And he, he, he does ask for advice, but I don't think he'll ever admit it. <laughs> <laughs> on, 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 the, on the pitfalls and that kind of stuff because that's just what kids like aren't they they don't want yeah uh, to be seen yeah. to be doing that kind of stuff but, but well I, i'm quite lucky with, with my son in that respect because we're quite close and we talk yeah. and stuff so you know you know it, he's good he's, he's a chip off the old block so it, it, any potential pitfalls that you specifically could see a band falling into specifically right other than you know working hard and all that kind of stuff is there any physical things that you might have made an error with in the past or just something that a band might learn from listening to this podcast around, you know, going into the industry and maybe signing things or, you know. Well, well, obviously, yeah. I mean, every, every young band signs a contract and gets excited and then realizes three or four years down the road that they perhaps shouldn't have signed that contract. I mean, we're, we're probably the same ourselves. Yeah. I, I just, 
I just think what I just said, really, just just yeah. be yourselves as much as possible, but just appreciate the good things that happen and make it, make it aware that you are appreciative of it mm. because you get asked back to do things again because, oh, yeah, I remember they, they were good, you know. Yeah. You know, the best will in the world, we can't all swag around like Liam Gallagher because it won't work for the majority of people yeah. or it does for him, you know. You know, he, he found his niche in that way, but it doesn't work. And I also think you should stop and smell the roses as much as possible. Just to pre just be appreciative of, of what's happened to you and, and where your career could potentially go from here. Sure. Just get on the M1. Get on the M1 and get out there. <laughs> Good on you. Good tips there. Great. Thanks for that, Rick. Um, so, yeah, the, the big tour has been announced. Um, where have I got it here? So uh, with support from Mark Morris from the Blue Tones, Nigel Clark from Dodger, Chris Elm from the Seahorses, performing together as mch they're the support act for the yes the tour. What, what, yeah. i'm not familiar with the act I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with all the people in it what what is what what's going on there what information can you give us on what to well support? they've basically i think because they've been up over the last few years going up and down the country doing acoustic gigs hmm probably in the same venues, but separately. They've got to know each other really well. And mm. uh, well, I think Mark and Nigel were friends before they were both in, even in bands. Yeah. Um, but they've uh, decided to form a super group. So basically what they're going to do is there's going to be the three of them on stage. They're going to sing a couple of Blue Tone songs, a couple of Seahaw songs, a couple of Dodgy songs together as a three piece, harmonizing and playing the guitars. And then I think they've, ri they've written a couple of songs together uh, and I think they're going to do a couple of cover versions and sing it all together. So, so it's going to be interesting and exciting to see that. And plus, it's a good package that really for a night out, you're getting quite a lot of uh, value for money there. Shed Seven fans are going to love that, aren't they? Oh yeah, I think it's perfect. It works yeah. really well. You know, I think I think this month, the month that it's happening, is going to be one long massive party. Yeah. Yeah, so the tour, another night, another town, the greatest it's live tour, Shed 7 are back, out on the road. How much are you looking forward to uh, the live gig environment after uh, the last, you know, shit show of 12, 18 months that we've had? <laughs> yeah, it is going to be a bit weird, to be honest, but I'm sure yeah. I'm just going I'm just to keep me here to the ground and see what happens over the summer with these festivals that are yeah. happening. Um, and then I'm sure lots of bands and acts will be going out and about in the autumn. So we were waiting till December anyway, but yeah, I'm going to keep, just keep a close eye on what's happening. Um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to performing because yeah. we've all been stopped from doing that. But yes, let's just see what, what the situation is. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that if we're all, if we are all allowed in a room, if 4,000 people are allowed to stand indoors in a room together and they're allowed to sing their hearts out, I think even if we did a really bad gig, people would still love it because they've got that option to be able to go out and just see a band, even though, even though we won't be doing a bad gig, by the way. Oh, of course. And uh, <laughs> one, of, one of the, another topic that we've been talking about on the podcast is people's anxiety of being out and in the live music environment again. I know as a gig goer myself, I'm still a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm still not comfortable with being around a lot of people yet. It will happen. It, it just, it'll, it's only going to take me a couple of times just to get back in that environment and just get back into the swing of things again. But mm. I think there's a real um, opportunity for us to talk about and to maybe advertise, you know, save spaces for people that might have anxiety that I start going back to live gigs as well that I want to be talking about more as we go further into yeah. a, a live yeah. gig environment. Too. I totally agree. I, I, I can get anxious just going out, out having a wander around town now that we're mm. allowed to you know yeah. I, I think sometimes i'm not used to all of these people walking around me and past me yeah. you know so yeah I, I think a lot of people might struggle with that but as you say as long as that's catered for mm. then then everyone should really be happy yeah yeah, definitely. So I'm going to put the gigs to buy your tickets now. Uh, gigsandtours.com, ticketmaster.co.uk for the new tour. I'm excited. I'm going to be coming to the Sheffield one and the Manchester one. I think I live in Manchester now, mate. So I'm going to be good man. I'm going to That's come to good. the couple of them. Uh, treat yourself. Get yourself out of there. Um, is there anything that you want to share with the fans before we uh, before we let you get off and enjoy the rest of your day? Uh, well, I'll just I'll just say thank you to anyone who's already bought a ticket, and uh, if you're running an hour in. 
just buy one because you'll you be yeah. in for a good night out and uh, and hopefully we'll see everyone in December. Yeah, definitely. Well, Rick, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, joining us down for this podcast today. I really appreciate your time. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy whatever you're doing with the rest of your, your lives up to the tour. <laughs> I'm sure you've busy got loads on. Oh, yeah, there's loads happening. Yeah, loads. Anything away from Shed 7 that's happening that you'd like to talk about? Uh, to be honest, not that much, really. In that <laughs> okay. respect. No, but I'm about to get my back garden done. Okay. So, so I'm getting some nice new paving, if you really want to know. Are you doing that yourself? I am not. I used to. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I want it to. I want it to be good and last. So I'm <laughs> okay. not. <laughs> Brilliant. Really appreciate your time, mate. And speak soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you know that you can support our podcast in many ways? Within the description of this podcast, you will see a list of all the equipment that we use. These are Amazon affiliate links. Clicking on these links take you to Amazon. If you buy whatever you're planning that week, we get a small kickback and you get a parcel at no extra cost. We would really appreciate your support. Or you can just go old school and donate a pound or whatever you feel is appropriate in there. Please subscribe, tell a friend about our show. And thank you for your support and we'll see you next week.